Okay, so we're talking arc length and curvature. The goal is to find the arc length of a curve, to calculate an arc length parameterization of, of a curve C, and to calculate K, which is going to stand for curvature at a, at a particular point. Or it could be a curvature function also. Um, the convention. C is a nice smooth curve given by R of T. So picture, picture a nice curve in space or in the plane with no, it might have slow turns, but nothing sharp, no sharp edges to it. So C is going to look like that. And it's going to be given by some vector valued function uh, R of T. Okay? All right. So with that convention in mind, let's, let's get started. Um, <coughs> the first theorem we want to look at is the one that gives us arc length. So the arc length, and we'll call this arc length lowercase s, the arc length s of a curve C from let's say t equals a, where t is the parameter, t equals a to t equals b. Uh, and this is, by the way, is with the understanding that the curve is only traced out once as t goes from a to b. <coughs> so c traced out exactly one time as, as t goes from a to b. Uh, you won't have the curve traced out multiple times, in other words. Um, then the arc length turns out to be the integral from A to B of the magnitude of R prime of T dt. So this is, uh, this is the big formula that you need to know. And I'll show you why it's true with an intuitive justification. So imagine um, a nice smooth curve, maybe it looks like that. And maybe this is our point A, which is essentially given by R evaluated at T equals A. And this is our point B, which is gonna be given by the vector valued function r evaluated at little lowercase b. Okay, t equals b. Then how do we find the actual length of the arc? If you were to travel on the arc from a to b, how do we calculate its length? Uh, well, you actually explored this question for a two-dimensional arc length in Calc 2, didn't you? Um, well, this explanation that I'm about to give could easily apply to curves that live in R3, in, in space, as well as in the curve. So the idea is this. The idea is to break up the curve into a bunch of sub-arcs. I'm going to make one of these sub-arcs longer than the other so, I can, so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to make this sub-arc go from here to here. But imagine breaking up the curve into a bunch of sub-arcs and finding the length of each subarc, which if you zoom in on is almost a, a linear, isn't it? If you were to zoom in on any subarc, <coughs> it would almost be linear. So let's see if we can do that. Okay, now, does it, now it looks even more linear, doesn't it? That's the point. On really small interval length subarcs for a smooth curve, gotta be a smooth curve for this to be true, the subarcs will be approximately linear and that's gonna be critical to developing our formula, which means a smooth curve is critical Right? Can't have a sharp end. Okay. Um, let's go back to just 100% view. So imagine figuring out the length of each subarc and then summing them together. Taking the limit as the number of subarcs goes to infinity, which means the distance between the subarcs is decreasing to zero. Oh, well, that's an integral, isn't it? Yeah. So we're going to develop an integration formula, the one I just gave you, in fact, for evaluating this. But let me justify that for you. Okay. Maybe I should go a little 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 bit zoomed in okay so focus on this sub arc um, if if this sub arc were actually small enough then 
this would almost be a right triangle, wouldn't it? I mean, it, you can actually see the curve here, but if I did it on one of these, it would, it would really look like a hypotenuse. This sub-arc length would look like a hypotenuse, wouldn't it? Okay, so we're going to call this arc length here, this sub-arc here, we're going to call that length ds. And I want you to think of ds as an infinitesimally small piece of arc length. So if I had drawn this just a wee bit straighter so that that side looks horizontal and that side looks vertical, and we still have a right triangle there, then uh, you might believe that we could call this side delta x. So the length of this side is delta x or dx. And the length of this side is delta y, which is approximately equal to dy. DY actually stands for the change in height of the tangent line over this distance DX. So they're not exactly the same. Delta Y would be the change in height of the f actual function. But it's close, right? Especially it gets closer and closer as the number of seven intervals goes to infinity. So what good old formula is going to give us DS? It's your old friend, Pythagorean. the Pythagorean theorem, right? So DS squared is going to equal dx squared uh, and I'm putting it in parentheses just so it doesn't look like I'm squaring just the x uh, and dy plus dy squared or the square root of that right and you know that these differentials behave like algebraic quantities so um, I'm going to multiply on the right side here by dt over dt. And I'm going to bring this bottom dt inside the radical, which means I have to square it. So that on the left-hand side, I'll get ds is equal to, okay, see if you believe this, dx dt, the whole thing squared, plus dy dt, the whole thing squared. And then on the outside, we have this dt. Do you believe that? Okay. So then what we're saying is this piece of arc length, which we're calling ds, it's this sub arc, is a pro, I mean, I used equal signs, it's really approximate, right? Um, it's approximately equal to this length element, if you want to call it that. And then the idea is to sum all such link, link elements. You can make a Riemann sum out of it, and then in front of that, take the limit as the number of subintervals goes to infinity, and assuming that that limit exists, you get that the actual arc length s is equal to the integral from a to b of this guy. But what is, th what is this guy in front of the dt? Well, it's nothing more than x prime of t, dx dt is x prime of t, so it's x prime of t squared <coughs> plus y prime of t squared. So within this justification, I was assuming that r of t is given by a two-dimensional vector with components x of t and y of t. And then we have the dt on the outside. So, but, but this guy is exactly the magnitude of our prime of t, isn't it? Including the square root? Uh, yeah, we want to square that as well. Now, now, what I just said is actually true, right? Okay, so yeah, if you do that sum and take the limit of that sum, and that limit of that sum exists, then by our definition of a limit of a Riemann sum, we get that S is, in fact, um, the integral from a to b of the magnitude of r prime of t dt. Okay, which is what we were trying to show. But by the way, because of the way the distance formula works, this argument works just as well if you have a, a dz squared. 
okay? Because of the way the distance formula uh, generalizes into space. So um, it works, Th this formula works in, s in the plane, it works in space. So we're gonna find the arc length of R of t from t equals zero to t equals pi halves. So uh, the first thing you'll want to do is look at the formula and write it down every time you use it. So S arc length is equal to the integral from A to B. And this is the lower limit. A is the lower limit on T. B is the upper limit on T. Magnitude R prime of T dt. If you look at this formula from the inside out, from the integrand on out, it tells you what you need to do, right? The integrand is the magnitude of R prime of T. But in order to find the magnitude of R prime of T, what do you need to find first? R prime of T. So what is R prime of T then? So we just take derivative component by component. So what do we get? We get 3. Uh, take the derivative with respect to T. So what's the derivative of negative 2 sine of T? That would be negative 2 cosine. Derivative of 2 cosine t? Negative 2 sine t. And that's the uh, derivative, our prime. Now, how do, you how do you find the magnitude of a vector? Okay, so we're going to take the magnitude of our prime of t, and that is going to be the square root of what? 9 plus what? You square all the components and add them together, right? Four cosine squared t. What do you get when you square negative two sine t? Two, three, four, four, three, yeah, and hopefully you see an identity coming. What do I have to do first? Take out the four, and what's left? Yeah, one is left in the form of cosine squared t plus sine squared t. So this is really going to be 9 plus 4 underneath the radical, or root 13, because this guy is just 1. Does that make sense to you? So then what does this integral become? Realizing, uh, okay, let me go back up here. Realizing that, wh wh what's a going to be? A is going to be that guy. B is going to be this guy. So what does this integral become? The integral from? Okay, uh, 0 to pi halves of just root 13 <coughs> dt. That's not bad at all, is it? If you wanted to, you could pull out, and I recommend doing this, pull out the constant. Root 13 times the integral 0 to pi over 2 dt. Anybody remember what that is? Well, it's just pi over 2. When uh, the lower limit is 0 like this and the integrand is 1, it's just going to be pi over 2. Let me remind you why that's true. So when you integrate this, yeah, you get t evaluated from the lower limit 0 to the upper limit pi halves. But of course, when you plug in the lower limit, you just get minus zero, right? So you plug in the upper limit first, you get pi halves, you plug in the lower limit. This is one version of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So with the radical 13 out in front, you have, um, if I turn it around, pi times radical 13 all over 2. And whatever units, right? I, I didn't specify units, so whatever the units are. And that would be the length of the arc uh, traced out from t equals 0 to t equals pi over 2. Make sense? Okay. Let's, before the break then, talk about the arc length function. Okay, we want to define the arc length function. Well, okay, so out of that S, remember lowercase s represents arc length, we're going to make a function out of it. 
And basically in the formula then, we're just going to change the upper limit in the arc length formula, we're going to change it to t and make a function out of this integral. Lower limit's a. But then we'll have to use a dummy variable for the, for the variable of integration. So we'll, instead of r prime of t, use r prime of u, because we already used t up here. So r prime of u, magnitude r prime of u, du. And that's it. That's, that's the arc length function. So this is another one that you need to know. But if you can remember the arc length formula, you can remember the arc length function. Okay. You might ask what this is for. Well, it's really important, and you're going to find out what it's for in just a little bit. A couple of notes here. Note number one. Uh, just a statement on what this is. S of t measures the distance along C Again, C, capital C, is the curve traced out by R of T um, from R of A which is going to be given by X of A, all of the component functions evaluated at A, Y of A, Z of A, to R of B which is x of b, component-wise it's x of b, y of b, and z of b. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking of the arc length function. I, I, need, I need to replace the b with a t. And then it'll have the advantage of actually making sense. So uh, r of t. Okay, so that would be x of t, y of t, and z of t. So for any particular value of t, it's just finding arc length, isn't it? Note number two, the s from s of t is called the arc length parameter. Let's underline that because it's an important piece of terminology that we're going to use a lot. And then uh, note number three, ds dt, since we've just defined a function of t, we can take the derivative of it. And let's examine what the derivative of this function should be. How does an integral relate to a derivative? Don't they kind of undo each other? Yeah? So if you think if you took the derivative, I'm going to erase this in a second, but think if you took the derivative of both sides of the statement, d dt. So that's ds dt on the left side, right? And then d dt. You remember how that works, how to take that derivative? You actually just take the integrand, and this is uh, part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. You actually just take the integrand and evaluate it at the upper limit. So you get magnitude r prime of t. Let me erase all that stuff because I don't want to mess up the statement of the formula. So ds dt is just equal to the magnitude of r prime of t. And that's saying something in terms of rates of change, isn't it? The rate of change of s with respect to t is equal to the magnitude of r prime of t. In the next section, we're going to call that the speed. If r represents the uh, position function of a particle at time t, as it often does in physics, then ds dt is going to be the speed of that particle at, at time t. Uh, let's find an arc length parameterization of Okay, my vector valued function is r of t. I'm going to give it to you in i, j, k notation. Uh, 3 plus 2t is your i component. So 3 plus 2t i plus 4 plus t j minus 5t k um, with a, the beginning 
value of t equal to 0. So what would r prime of u be? Just remember, replace any t with u, although it may not be an issue here since all the component functions are linear. r prime of u, whoops, force of habit, r prime of u would be what? Just 2i plus j minus 5k. Notice the, the variable didn't even show up here, but, but had we not had linear components, you would want to use a u instead of t when you, for when you set up the integral. Okay. And then, so that's our prime. What's the magnitude of our prime? Square root of uh, 4 plus 1 squared is 1 plus 25. So root 30, yeah? So let's find the arc length function, and then I'll show you how to turn that into, or use that to find a parameterization of r in terms of s. So that's what this, in case, in case I didn't make this clear, which I didn't, uh, when it says find an arc length parameterization, uh, what it really means is we want we want r, want the vector valued function r in terms of s. Okay? r in terms of s. That's what we mean by an arc length parameterization. So we want the parameter to be s instead of t. Okay. So the start of that is just plugging into the arc length. Uh, formula. So the arc length formula says in general s of t is equal to the integral from a to t of the magnitude of r prime of u du. Okay, so s of t in this example then is the integral from what was a? We told you a was zero to make things easy. And then the magnitude of r prime of u is just root 30. You. And then what will this be? Can you get this without actually doing the integration? If you have a constant in here and the lower limit's zero, so think about it this way. Bring the constant out. That means the integrand becomes one du, right? You integrate, you get u evaluated from zero to t, <coughs> which just gives t. So you get root 30 times t. So dropping the function notation, the name of the function is s, right? We only use, we, we don't have to use the full function notation. We could just use s instead of s of t. If we want t in terms of s, it's easy enough to do after, as long as the integral is doable. All we gotta do is solve for t. And we've got t equals s over root 30. Sorry, my s's look like 5 sometimes. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That means we can plug this guy to get the arc length parameterization. We can plug this guy into a t, wherever we see a t in uh, the original formula, which is way up here. So we could plug this guy in here for t, here, and here, and we'll have it. We'll have our arc length parameterization. Okay. So let's write it down. So by the way, if you think about it, if you use the full function notation, this is the same thing as saying t of s, right, equals s divided by root 30. Okay. Uh, all right, so we plug it in. Um, we get, ultimately it's r of s, but if you want to, you could call it r of t of s. Ultimately, r of t of s is a function of s. <coughs> equals 3 plus plus 
two times this guy, right? So s over root 30 or just 2s over root 30, and that's times i plus 4 plus s over root 30, j, minus 5s over root 30, k. Okay, so some notes involving the uh, arc length parameter. It turns out that if you parameterize r in terms of s and take its derivative, so in other words, r prime of s, where s is the arc length parameter, that turns out to be t of t, the unit vector in the direction of motion, or the unit tangent vector, as we called it last time. Remember, the unit tangent vector, t of t, is computed by taking r of t, r prime of t, rather, and dividing by its magnitude. That's the definition of it that we came up with last time, right? When you divide a vector by its magnitude, you get a unit vector. And r prime is tangent, so when you take r prime of t and divide it by its magnitude, you get a unit vector that's tangent to the curve. And, um, and that's just, that's where the definition comes from. But earlier, okay, let me switch to, um, Li do you remember Leibniz notation? r prime of t can be written as dr, the derivative of the vector valued function r, with respect to t. Leibniz notation works very well with vector valued functions. Remember that? So it's like dx dt, but r is a vector valued function. So we're really, we're really saying, hey, with dr dt, we're really saying, hey, take the derivative of each of the components, uh, the, the first, second, and third components with respect to t. But then remember earlier, we discovered that the magnitude of r prime of t is ds dt. This was a big result from an earlier note. It was, we can go back and find it, I bet. Yeah, note number three from the last set of notes. Um, this came from basically the, uh, the definition of uh, the arc length function along with taking the derivative of both sides of that arc length function. And that's the key to the proof. Now, if you remember, as long as we have nice differentiable functions, um, and dsdt isn't equal to zero, of course, which is going to be the case here, we're going to require that, then the reason why we like Leibniz notation is because the operations behave like algebra. dsdt behaves like a, a fraction dividing by dsdt. It, the, the result, the, what it's equal to, it looks like fraction arithmetic. It's just beautiful. So we can rewrite this as dr dt times dt ds. We have a theorem from Calc 1 that says we can do that. But then we know that by the chain rule, this is equal to and, and it, it looks like cancellation, which is, I mean, that's not really what's happening here. We have a theorem that says this is true, but it looks like algebraic cancellation division, right? Um, we have a theorem then that says this is equal to just the RDS. And this last bit is actually the chain rule. So the last bit is actually the chain rule. But that's the whole ball game because drds is r prime of s. So we just went from, if you follow the equal signs, we went from t of t to r prime of s. Note number two. It does turn out if the magnitude of r prime of m for some parameter m, if that magnitude turns out to be 1, then 
m is the arc length parameter, m equals s. That one's a little harder to prove, but it's not surprising. It's not surprising. So we're saying that there's only one way to parameterize r so that uh, I I uh, you can uh, take the magnitude of r prime and get one, and that's by using the arc length <coughs> parameter. Okay, so now we're ready for the big definition of the day, curvature. So this is curvature of a curve C um, and, and let's say this, the curve C we're going to require so that it's unique that we're going to require that the curve C is parameterized by S. So when I write it, uh, C colon R of S, I'm saying this R of S is a vector valued function. S is the parameter where S is arc length, okay? So that we have a standard definition. Um, so what this definition is about to do for us is describe, to describe how sharply a curve bends at a particular value of s. So as you might expect, you're going to have a larger value of curvature um, for a sharp curve than a gentle curve. That, that would be our goal, right? The sharper the curve, the higher the curvature. Okay, so this quantity, we call it capital K for curvature. And it's going to be defined by the magnitude of the derivative of t, the unit tangent vector, with respect to s. In other words, if you were to, to calculate it directly, you would have to find t, parameterize with respect to s, and then take the derivative of it, and then take its magnitude. So both notations mean the same thing. Okay, so why, why will this measure how curvy a curve is, right? Why, wh why will it do that? So I'll write a note and then I'll show you a picture. K is the magnitude of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length, WRT with respect to arc length S. Since the magnitude of the unit tangent vector is equal to 1, the only change that occurs in T along a curve C, along its curve C, is due to the bend in C. Because the length is not changing. So if there's a big change in the bend, there's going to be a big change in K. So let me say that. More, the more, more bend, let's call this a quantity, more bend more bend equals uh, larger K. Larger K, K stands for curvature. So let me show you a picture. So this is a curve C. Let's look at evenly spaced arcs, uh, sub arcs across this curve. Um, and let's suppose that these guys represent unit tangent vectors. So each one of these guys in red represents a particular value of T for a particular uh, uh, S value, a parameter value. Notice there's not a whole lot of change 
from this guy to this guy in terms of the bend, right? But there is a lot of change from this guy to this guy. So there's more curve here, more change in the direction of T. So you're going to expect a bigger K. You're going to expect a bigger K in this region than in this region. You're going to expect a bigger K here than here. The next theorem, I, I'm just going to state the next theorem because the proof looks a lot like the last proof I did. Turns out that K is equal to the magnitude of T prime of T, where T is any old parameter. Um, T prime <coughs> divided by the magnitude of R prime of T. This is really easy to use prove using differentials just like that last result I proved. Uh, you can just go straight from the Leibniz form of these things. Use the fact that the magnitude of R prime of T equals ds dt and you'll end up uh, at the curvature formula. The next theorem is what we're going to use to calculate curvature. Curvature, okay, again, we're assuming C is given by R of T, okay? C is a curve in space given by R of T. It could be in the plane, as I'll show you. Then it turns out that the calculation formula that we're going to use, because the definition is, in many cases, almost impossible to use. Not impossible, but very difficult to use to calculate curvature, okay? So it turns out this formula is relatively easy. We take the, ma it's not going to look easy, but it is, trust me. The magnitude of R prime of T, we take that and cross it with R double prime of T, and we divide by the magnitude of R prime of T to the third power. It looks horrible, but it's really not as bad as using the other formulas usually. Let's, let's find K as a function of T. Find K of T for R of T equals 2t squared i plus tj plus one half t squared k. And let's, let's take a look at the formula. What does this formula tell us we need? Dissect it. And it's just like applying operations. You have to go from the inside out, right? So what do you have to compute first? If you want to compute the cross product of R prime and R double prime, what do you have to do first? You got to find R prime and then R double prime. There's an order to things and the formula itself tells you the order. So don't memorize steps, memorize the relevant formulas. You want to memorize as little as possible. So memorize the formulas and then the formulas give you the steps. So okay, what's R prime of T? So, 4ti plus just j plus tk. And then what's our double prime? Well, 4i, 0 for the j component, so we don't write it down when we're in ijk form. And then for the k component? just 1k, right? Then what does the formula say to do after that? Take the cross product. So you can shorten the notation, just r prime cross r double prime is probably easier to write down than r prime of t cross r double prime of t. All right, so here's some good practice for you. i, j, k, right? We're finding a cross product. In the middle, we put in 4t, 1, and t, that's our prime, right? And then what would the third vector be, the third row? Our double prime would be 4, 0, 1. All right, good. Okay, cross out the first column and take the um, determinant of this little 2 by 2 matrix right here, and that'll be your i component. What does that get you? So just uh, one I, yeah. And then 
if you cross out the middle column and take the determinant of the 4t t41 what do you actually get you actually get zero don't you and so there's a built-in minus there let's not forget that minus and then it'll be 4t minus 4t right so just to show the work and then that's j and then k would be just cross out last column 4t times 0 is 0 minus, so minus 4k. So i minus 4k, would you guys buy that? And then what does the formula say to do with that? Look, on, look in the numerator of the formula. We've got to find the magnitude. So r prime cross r double prime magnitude. So that's going to be the square root of 1, right? 1 squared plus negative 4 squared, which is 16. So root 17. Okay, that's the numerator. And then what's the denominator? R prime of t, magnitude, the whole thing cubed. I'm going to write down R prime magnitude cubed, so I don't forget to cube it. It's really easy to forget to cube it. Okay, so let's go back. We know what our prime is. We just need to find the magnitude. The magnitude is going to be, okay, we're going to write down the square root, and then let's write down the third power so we don't forget. So you're going to take, to find the magnitude, you're going to take the first component, square it. What's that? 16t squared. The second component, square it plus 1, the third component, plus t squared. What does that turn out to be? The square root of 17t squared plus 1, and then the whole thing cubed. So k of t, if you include the function notation, is going to be root 17 over the square root of 17 squared plus 1, the whole thing cubed, or you could write it like this, root 17 over 17 t squared plus 1 to the 3 halves power. Because when you square, when you take a, a square root to the third power, it's the same as the 3 halves power. Okay? So if you, if you wanted to know the curvature at a particular point on the curve, you would plug in the t value that corresponds to that point, that generates that point, into k of t, and that would tell you how curvy the curve is. Okay? The bigger the t, the more curve, the more curvy the curve. Okay. So, little note here. Number one. To find k for a planar function like y equals f of x. Th this, is a, this is an important thing to know, not just for this problem. You can use the above formula um, that we used in the last example. But you have to think of a planar function as a vector valued function. How do you do that? Well, just let x equal t. Then r of t is automatic. The first component is x, which is t, right? If x equals t, the first component's t. y, the second component then becomes f of, right? x is t. y becomes f of t. And the third component is, if it's in the plane, the third component is 0. And by writing a planar function that way, you can use the above formula on it. So let's take a look at that. So in this example, let's let f of x equal 2x squared plus 5. Let's find a numerical value of k. Find k at uh, x equals negative 1. 
Okay, use the above note. I said note number one. It really is the only note. Use the above note to write um, f of x as a vector valued function r of t. Can you guys tell me how, how you would do that? that? That would be a good start to finding curvature. So I could write, uh, well, first of all, what do you let x equal? <coughs> Yeah, if it's not x, then you you know you could use what you can actually use x if you want. It doesn't really matter what you call the parameter, but most people are more comfortable letting x equal something familiar like t in terms of a parameterization. So let x equal t. Then r of t becomes what? The first component is automatically x, which is t, or we're calling it t. The second component is f of t, which would be what? 2t squared plus 5. And the third component? 0. OK. So if you now apply the formula, remember the above formula, you need to find r prime. What's r prime of t here? It's going to be? 1. What's the second component? 4t, the third component? 0. What's our double prime going to be? 0, 4, 0. And then I'm just going to give it to you. It turns out that r prime cross r double prime is equal to Four, which you could calculate pretty quickly, but I'm running low on time, so I'm just gonna just gonna give it to you. Okay. Uh, actually, it's four k, but then when you take the magnitude, you get four. So I'll let you guys compute that on your own. It's pretty easy, actually. So then, what would uh, the curvature be? Well, I guess we need the magnitude of r prime cubed, don't we? What would the magnitude of r prime cubed be? Now well, you square this guy, add it to this guy squared, what does that become? Maybe a, if I put the 16t squared in front plus 1, would that bother you too much? Okay. So the function would be k of t equals... Remember this guy for uh, uh, magnitude r prime cross r double prime on top, and then this guy in the bottom. And then we, we cube it. But remember, the problem asked us to find the actual curvature at x equals negative 1. Well, uh, x is t, right? So all we have to do is plug in uh, negative 1 for t, and we'll, we'll have our answer. What do we end up with? If we plug in one for negative 1 for t down here, you end up squaring it. So what do you get? Root 17 cubed, or maybe you might like uh, 4 divided by 17 to the 3 halves better. <laughs>